Why do currencies collapse? Why are there countries, even today, where people struggle to have their basic necessities met because the inflation rate is greater than 100% per month? How does this even happen? And what can countries do to prevent this from happening again? Is the U.S. on a similar path? We're going to examine these topics with our next guest, who is one of the world's leading authorities on currency reform, Steve Hankey, professor of applied economics at Johns Hopkins University. Over his career, he's advised many countries on combating hyperinflation, including the former Yugoslavia and Argentina, among many others. Professor Hankey also served on Ronald Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors. Good to have you back, Professor Hankey. Welcome. Well, thank you, David. Good to be with you. To examine the question of why currencies collapse, we can draw on some historical and contemporary examples. Let's start with recent news first. So Argentina has been making the news. Over the weekend, the government announced new rate hikes by about 600 basis points, which would bring their interest rate up to 97%. This is done to combat their 109% inflation as of April. So my first question is, how did this even happen? to Argentina? How do they get to this situation that they're in today? Well, uh, now you're getting in an area that I, I actually know, know a little bit about because I spent pretty much all of the decade of the 90s in Argentina, uh, either as an advisor to President Menem or uh, Domingo Cavallo, who was the economics minister at the time. And also, I was president of Toronto Trust Argentina in Buenos Aires. It was a fund that turned out to be the best performing fund in the world in 1995. So I know that I know the territory and, and I know a little bit about the peso. Now, as it turns out, uh, let, let, let us look first. Let, let's just do the contemporary thing rather than getting into too much history of Argentina. Yes. Maybe we can maybe we can loop back on the his, some of the historical aspects, yes. which which by the way, most people don't understand at all uh, what, what was going on in the 1990s in Argentina. But but at any rate, uh, since January 2022, the peso has depreciated by 53.8 percent. So that that means it's 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 essentially against the dollar, of course. Now that means it's really collapsed. You said the official inflation rate was 109 percent. Actually, I measure it every day. It's 148 percent today. I just measured it. Again, that's the official number, not really an accurate number. The accurate number is you know 50 basis points higher than that, but. But at any rate, the interest rate, you said, uh, had been increased to 97%. Now, a lot of people think, oh, boy, that's that's a, you know, punishing inflation uh, interest rate. It, it isn't, because if you subtract 97 from 148%, which is my measure of inflation, the, the real interest rate adjusted for inflation is a negative 51%. So it's a great place to borrow money in because you're paying, you have an inflation adjusted negative interest rate. And of course, 97% isn't nearly high enough to keep people in pesos. Now, what's going on? Why, why is the currency collapsed? Well, the currency has collapsed because the money supply has exploded. They keep printing pesos. So if you print a lot of pesos, especially in Argentina, what happens? You eventually have inflation. It's 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 all about money. It's it remember it's a it's a quantity theory of money. M V equals P Y. M money supply. V velocity equals P price level times Y real economic activity. So. It's all about a money supply, excess money explosion, and in addition to that explosion in the money supply, you have people who are very sensitive to what's going on in Argentina. Our, our, the Argentines are very clever and, and used to all of this. So as they see the, the printing press is rolling hot, the velocity of money actually goes up. So, so it aggravates the situation. So M is going up, NV is going up, 
and y, the which is on the right-hand side of the equation of exchange, y, let's say kind of constant, well, what's that mean? If m is going up and v is going up, <laughs> p, the price level, is shooting up to the stars. So that's that's what's going on in Argentina. The, the only way to solve it is to dollarize the country, get mothball the reserve bank, uh, the central bank in Argentina, mothball the peso, put them in museums, and replace the peso with the U.S. dollar. Now, it turns out that the presidential campaign has already started in Argentina for the next election, and Javier Millet is one of the candidates, and, and he has proposed a plan that actually I proposed at President Menem's request in 1999, dollarization. That'll fix the problem. You just get rid of the get rid of the peso completely. Then then the pay, the local currency doesn't collapse because there is no local currency. The currency is the U.S. dollar, which everyone wants anyway. The the, the economy in Argentina is, by the way, with all this inflation and depreciation of the peso, there's something called spontaneous dollarization that occurs where. People spontaneously, they try to get dollars. They get, try to get away from the peso. So informally, the economy is, is very dollarized already anyway. So if you just made the dollar legal tender, that's, that's, the, that's the answer. And Malay is proposing to do this. And he's running very strongly in the polls, by the way. So, so this is a real possibility for Argentina. And they would solve their currency crisis problem once and for all, if that's what they did. I, I, I want to talk about dollarization and solutions in just a minute, but I want, let's go back to their money supply. So you are correct. Let me, let me put a chart up on the screen for the audience to see. Since 2020, uh, the Argentina money supply M2 has increased by almost seven times, according to this chart that I'm looking at. That's a period of three years. Um, wait, why has this happened is my question. This, le this leads to the ultimate question of why currencies collapse. Well, like you said, because of too much money printing, why did they increase their money supply by an order of seven times in the last three years? Well, the, what, what happens is the, the, in, there, there are a variety of things, but at the, at the nub of, the, of hyperinflations and very high inflations, it's always the same problem. The government is spending more than they're taking in and they're running huge deficits. And what happens? The government goes to the central bank and they say, look, we, you've got to finance these deficits. We can't raise enough taxes. We, we can't sell bonds to finance them to the public domestically or in the case of Argentina internationally because they're cut off from the international financial markets. So they go to the central bank and say, we've, we've got some wonderful paper to sell you. And, and the central banker with a gun at his head says, yes, I, I agree. And, and he credits the account of the government. Now, when he credits the account of the government, that does finance a deficit, but it monetizes a deficit because that credit to the government is money. So the money, that's why, that's why that, that chart that you have, the increase of money supply by seven times is, is very much connected to the government's deficit and deficit spending that has been monetized. And if it wasn't monetized, the money supply wouldn't grow and you wouldn't get inflation. Okay, so just to clarify, you're not proposing Argentina to peg its currency to the US dollar. You're you're, you're proposing dollarization, right? No, there, there are two things. I, I don't propose pegging. Pegging is a complete disaster. That 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 is uh, these pegged exchange rates are where where they peg a currency to the US dollar or the euro or some other anchor currency, those are disastrous because with, with a pegged exchange rate, you have a central bank and the central bank has a, an exchange rate policy, that's the peg. 
And they also have a monetary policy. They have discretion to change the rate of growth in the money supply. So, so they have two things. They, they have an exchange rate policy and a monetary policy. So, so, so dollarizing is not dollarizing is not pegging. Let's just set that distinction. No, no, here. no, no. Dollarizing is you're not pegging to anything. You're getting rid of the domestic currency and replacing it with with a foreign currency. That's that's what I did in Montenegro in 1999. The the Yugoslav dinar was the coin of the realm in Montenegro. It was a hyperinflating lousy currency. And what we did, I, I was the state counselor and chief advisor for President Djukanovic at the time, we made the German mark local uh, legal tender. We made the German mark legal tender. And of course, immediately, the Yugoslav dinar went out of circulation and was replaced by, officially, the German mark. So we, we shall we say, dollarized Montenegro. We replaced the Yugoslav dinar, the inflating currency, with the mighty German mark, and 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 within hours almost, inflation disappeared, and 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 you had a stable currency. The mark was a currency. There was no peg. There was no local currency to peg anything to. You have to have a local currency to peg it to some other foreign currency. That's what a peg is. So, if you have a peg. You have a monetary policy and a an exchange rate policy. The peg, whatever it is, is the exchange rate policy. Now, th those invariably end up in conflict because what happens is that for, for a variety of reasons, let's say the government starts running a big deficit with a peg. If they do, you will have a deficiency of savings in the country and, and they will also have an external current account deficit. And that external current account deficit, it has to be financed by inflows of foreign currency into the country. But what if foreigners, what if those foreign, what if those flows don't come in? Well, if the flows don't come in, you, you, you end up having a reduction in the foreign exchange in the country on the asset side of the balance sheet of the central bank, foreign exchange go down and to offset that reduction in foreign exchange, the central banks usually increase the net domestic assets that they have by selling bonds. And uh, I, I should say by buying bonds, by buying bonds, not selling bonds, domestic bonds. And when they do that, they of course increase the money supply. So, so you have you have the quality the the quantity of money is going up, and the quality is actually going down. And you then have a crisis in confidence, and usually the currency collapses. Now, now that's exactly what happened in Mexico in 1995. Remember the tequila crisis; it was a huge thing starting in December of 1994, actually, that rippled across all of Latin America and, and created huge currency crises throughout Latin America. That, that was one where the peg blew up because, because the foreign exchange was going down, the net domestic assets were going up, the money supply was going up in Mexico, the quality of that was going down because the foreign reserve cover per unit of peso was going down. You had a confidence problem, a huge speculative attack on the Mexican peso, and the, and the peg blew apart. The Asian financial crisis, which started in Thailand in July of 1997, that, that is this, exactly the same thing happened, and it, and it had huge ramifications internationally, not only in Asia, but internationally. And then, we had also in 1998, August 17th, 1998, the Russian ruble blew up, the peg blew up. All these were pegs blowing up. All, all of them are pegs. And, and remember the, the huge shock waves when the, when the ruble collapsed. You're, you're probably too young to even remember this, David, but if you look in history books, 
you'll you'll figure it out. This was a big deal when the ruble collapsed, and the tequila crisis, nineteen ninety five, Mexico, Asian financial crisis, nineteen ninety seven, nineteen nineteen ninety eight. The ruble collapse of August 1998, all those were pegs that blew apart. And and they were all because of the changing composition and the balance sheet. Let, let's go to the ruble, for example. I was the probably the first one to spot the, the, that this was going to go south. Early in 1998, I think it was February, I gave a speech in Vienna, Austria. And... And I noticed that and spoke about it at the conference. I said the balance sheet of the Russian Central Bank was deteriorating because the foreign assets were going down on the balance sheet and they were being replaced by domestic ruble bonds. And that domestic assets were going up. The foreign assets were going down. The overall money supply was going up. So the quality of the whole thing was going down. And I said something to the effect that the peg is probably not going to hold. I think the thing will blow up. There was some Reuters reporter in the room at that time. He, re- he reported what I said, and the ruble dropped 3% immediately after my after that wire went out and, and against the U.S. dollar. The result of that, of course, I, I rushed in and put a huge short position on the ruble, and 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 the and the thing did pay off big time at the end, at end of the so day. You, so you're going to tell us which currency to short by the end of this interview? <laughs> well, that's my that's my business, but that, you know, I'm I'm not certain I'm going to tell you that all the secret sauce, but <laughs> we we can we can go through historical episodes. Sure. And, and and that that was one, by the way. Uh, and in addition to that, I can say that I did participate in the tequila crisis in 1995, as well as the Asian financial crisis. So, so there's there's we're talking about firsthand experience here, not not academic. All right. So uh, going just let's finish up on Argentina. I want to talk about some other examples. So when it com- when a country dollarizes, um, and the country overspends. They don't have. Do they still have the option of printing money to fix their overspending no, problem? No. If the if a country is dollarized, they're, they're, they don't have a domestic currency. How can they print it? How can they print a, a domestic currency if they don't have it? Well, that's 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 kind of the point. Then, how do they how do they fix their deficit issues if they have one? Well, I, they they have to control a thing that. <laughs> dollarization puts a hard budget constraint in the system. That's the whole point. You can't monetize a deficit if you're dollarized and using a foreign currency. Well, well, what, what, if the country is, what if the country is poor, they don't have food and whatnot, and they need government assistance? You need, you need, the government you, needs you, to provide. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> what, 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 do you, what do you do in that case? You, you don't monetize a deficit and inflate things. You either have to increase taxes on somebody or you have to sell bonds domestically or internationally. That's the only, that's the only way you can finance a deficit. You, you, can, you have three ways. You can monetize it, printing more new money. Now, with dollarization or a currency board, which we'll talk about in a minute, those are out of the picture. You can't do. You can't monetize a deficit with dollarization or a currency board. So you're left with two choices. If you want to spend money in the government, and you 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 just said, well, what if people are poor? You you've got to provide them with food, shelter, and all the rest of it, and spend government money. Well, you've got to be able to raise taxes to do that, or sell government bonds to the general public domestically or internationally that's it that's that's the whole point of dollarization that (laughs) dollarization or currency board are are wonderful devices because they put the politicians in a straitjacket and and they are not allowed to go to a central bank monetize a deficit to finance it and create inflation and impose an inflation tax on the citizens of whatever the country happened to be. Well, the I think the uh, the question that people have 
after listening to this is why in particular do we have to choose the dollar as a reserve currency for a country? Why not literally anything else? Well, the, 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 the main reason is that, that, that there are two reasons. One is, is a practical thing. That, that's what people who are free choose on their own to substitute for their junk currencies. We're talking about Argentina. Argentina is heavily de facto dollarized because for decades, with the exception of the decade of 1990s, you've had a junk peso. And, and Argentines do what? They get rid of the junk and, and replace it with dollars that they put on in the safety deposit box or in, a, in an account in Miami or, or the Caymans or, 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 or what have you, or Uruguay. So that that's what people voluntarily do. What what if you if you were an Argentine that you'd have a, a stash of dollars. That's what you you'd prefer to do that privately. So you watch what people do. They they vote with their wallets. They vote with their wallets, and they want dollars in their wallets. So so that's one reason. And the second thing is a much more theoretical kind of abstract thing. And and the why why do people vote? with their wallets and choose dollars because it, it is the international currency. Whether, whether you like it or not, it is the king. End of story. I, I've been getting a lot of rhetoric, well, hearing as well as reading online and people telling me directly that they believe that the, the Yuan will appreciate against the USD uh, for political and or economic reasons. And I remind them that the Yuan is still soft pegged to the USD and that for that to happen, for an appreciation to happen, you need to first have the currency of the Chinese, the Yuan free float, which I don't know if the government's going to do. I'll let you comment on whether or not, A, they're going to allow a free floating Yuan and B, whether or not this is going to cause the Yuan to significantly appreciate against the USD as some people have speculated it might in the future. Well, I... I don't. I don't know who you're talking to, but they they really on another planet. I think uh, the the currency number one. It isn't a soft peg. It's it's a managed float. So so they they manage it and they they try to keep it in kind of a, a zone. Wait, what? Sorry, what what's the difference between a soft peg and a managed float? Well, the. the the, the it, it's definitional. Uh, the oh, okay. IMF has various classifications they use, and they when they I classify see. currency and and the and and and, and the man the managed float is the appropriate definition for uh, I the see Chinese currency. I, uh, okay. I, in I any suppose, case, yeah, they're they're managed. Could, I suppose you could. Uh, they're 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 really uh, a soft peg is not in the definite dictionary. It, it it doesn't exist in terms of the standard practice and procedure professionally. That that's just a, a term of art that's that's really not used. So 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 let, let let's call it what they call it in the dictionary, and and that is a managed float. Now uh, the managed float they do try to keep it in a zone. That's how they try to manage it, and. They also have capital controls in China. Now, if China went to a floating exchange rate, that's that's what you want to, you want me to take you from a managed float to a float. Is that correct? Yes, hypothetically. Okay. So okay, we're we're in the classroom now. This is a hypothetical. You're you're the professor. I'm I'm a student answering the thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I so never saw this day to happen. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, at any rate, professor, uh, here, here's 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 the way I would look at that, and also, by the way, as a as a as a currency trader, not just a student of these things, but a, as right. a currency trader, to float, they they would they would also accompanying that they they'd remove capital controls. Yes. And and there would be so much capital gushing out of China that that, that you, 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 you would you, your mind would be boggled by, by the amount that would be coming out. 
Now, what would that do to the float? The, the wand would collapse. It would be under tremendous, tremendous downward pressure. The, the, the capital controls are like a ring fence around the, 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 the Middle Kingdom. Now, it's kind of a leaky fence. A lot of capital leaks out. P -p Chinese are very clever people. They, they, they know how to get around things. They've had a lot of practice of getting around controls and so forth. So a lot leaks out, but believe me, there's a storehouse of capital, hot capital, waiting to escape the ring fence in China, and, and the escape would be massive. And that would put a lot of what? Downward, not upward, downward pressure on the one. So that's that's what would actually happen in this hypothetical. So whoever you're talking to, it should you should send them back a, a letter grade of F. What <laughs> we're just watch this episode and perhaps um, uh, you know, learn from Professor Hankey, who is a much better professor than I ever will be, uh, which is why you're over there and I'm over here. But Professor, let's talk about uh, the not hypotheticals, but the current situation. A lot of people, not just with me, but a lot of people on the internet and perhaps with other media have been talking about this trend of de-dollarization and the yuan overtaking the dollar to become the royal reserve currency. I know that's two separate topics here, okay? We're talking about currency appreciation relative to the U.S. dollar, which you just explained can't happen, but let's talk about the yuan replacing the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency. Going back to dollarization, do you ever foresee a scenario in which the Argentine, the Argentines will say, you know what, let's replace our currency with the yuan instead of the dollar? No, no, it, it's not going to happen. It, the, uh, no, number one, the, 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 in, in, in the discourse right now, in the run-up to the presidential election, Javier uh, Malay one of the candidates who's running very strong, if not le leading the polls, he he is proposing dollarization. So, so it, it, the the Chinese currency it's, it's a very hypothetical thing. It's it's not it's not in the game. The game is all all about the dollar. No, no one no one in Argentina is talking about the Chinese yuan, and and no one is seriously going to be talking about it because of capital controls. Who, who in the world wants a currency that, that is, has capital controls imposed on it? What, what if you have a business in China? Think about a practical thing. Think you have a big, huge operation in China and, and you, you earn Chinese yuan. The problem is that's fine. You have huge profits piling up. You're making a fortune. You can't get the money out. Unless you figure, unless you figure out a way to go around the ring fence, the de, the de-dollarization thing. Let me talk, make a remark about that. Um, there's a lot of talk, especially on social media, which mo most of it is absolute garbage. But but there's a lot of talk about it, and the reason why is that the U.S. stupidly, in my view, has weaponized the U.S. dollar. Because they have sanctions, they're, they're imposed. Want to impose financial sanctions on everybody? In fact, they even were thinking about imposing financial sanctions on Hong Kong in July of 2021. Now, why do I know that? I know that because Secretary of State Mike Pompeo called me one Sunday afternoon, and we spoke for 35 minutes. Now, why did Pompeo call me? He called me because he was told to call me and get my opinion on whether the U.S. should impose sanctions on Hong Kong. Hong Kong has a currency board system. The Hong Kong dollar is issued by the currency board. It trades at a fixed exchange rate of 7.8 Hong Kong for one U.S., and it's backed 100% by U.S. dollar reserves. That means the Hong Kong dollar, in fact, is a clone of the U.S. dollar, and there are U.S. dollars, obviously, 100% backing it up in Hong Kong. So I was adamantly opposed to imposing and weaponizing the U.S. dollar in the case of Hong Kong. This was late Sunday afternoon. 
Pompeo was adamant for it. He wanted to impose. There was a meeting in the White House with President Trump the, the next man, Monday morning, and and about midday, I got a call from the White House. The call said, Hanky, you won. Pompeo lost. No, no financial sanctions were imposed on Hong Kong. We, we have financial sanctions on about 30 countries. This gets back to where they, where they have imposed it. I'm against imposing it. And I, and I, won, the, I won the little battle uh, about Hong Kong. Actually, it was a big deal. But, but, but let's move on and talk about places where they've weaponized it. Well, they've weaponized it. This, do, this is not good in my view. It, it, it does make the dollar vulnerable. But the, the social media crowd, ma mainly the crypto crowd, you're hearing mainly from the crypto crowd about this. They go on and on about dollarization. Or you get people like Putin going on and on about it, or the mullahs and in, uh, in, in Iran or Lula in, in Brazil, any, anyone that, that perceives the U.S. as being an enemy talks about de-dollarization. But the reality, the reality is it, it's, that's a hypothetical. It's, it's this not happening yet. It might, it might someday. I'm not saying it will never happen, but I think predicting that I'm not clairvoyant so I, I really have no way of predicting that. I mean, after all, since the seventh century BC, that, that's before Christ, we've only had 14 international currencies. They last a long time. Do the math. The US dollar happens to be number 14 right now. To knock it out of the saddle, <laughs> the US would have to do a lot of, of real stupidities, even greater than they're already doing. Uh, let, so, let me give you a general statement that going back to the crypto crowd, and I've heard this from the precious metals or any hard asset crowd. Um, they've talked about how over the course of history, most fiat currencies have fallen in value. Um, and so it makes sense to hold your wealth in some sort of non-fiat denominated asset. Uh, precisely for that reason. Is that true? Is that factually? Let's fact check that for us. Let's, let's talk about precious metals, for example. Until the U.S., remember, closed the gold window in the early 1970s, that, that, was, the, that was the end of currencies being international currencies, international, the, the international currency being backed up with, with some metal. So since the early 70s, all currencies, whether they're international or not, have been fiat. And what's happened? Well, the, the, the only one that actually has a pretty good record, actually, since World War I, and, and has increased in its real inflation-adjusted basis is a Swiss franc. So uh, we, we've got what? Maybe... 180 to maybe 200 currencies in the world. And, and there's only one that's held its value. <laughs> so that's a Swiss franc. <laughs> so that, that's pretty much the fact check. Okay. All right. Well, uh, uh, so, that, so, that so leads there, to my so next there, question. So there is, there is, Sorry. Yeah, go on. Point that here, here's a, here, all, all fiat currencies are bubbles. Well, what does that mean? Well, they're all they're all they're all bubbles in the sense that they're not backed by anything. You can't redeem. They 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 might be usable in transactions depending on what country. Now, the Argentine peso isn't very usable, and even the Chinese yuan isn't very usable usable because it's not convertible. But but they're nothing. If you're fiat, you're not redeem. You can't redeem them in anything. You, you can't go to the central bank and say, oh, okay, you promised to give me so many ounces of gold and, or, or whatever the metal happens to be. Given our current economic conditions in the U.S., people have argued that the U.S. is headed down the same path as perhaps Venezuela and Argentina and that the dollar will collapse. I've seen those headlines a lot, especially in the last three months when the DXY has been trending steadily downwards. I've been seeing a lot of dollar will collapse headlines 
on social media and the internet. Yeah, uh, this, is, this is all coming from the crypto crowd. This is all propaganda. It, it's it's this baseless propaganda. And that doesn't mean that the U.S. is doing things properly. They, they shouldn't be weaponizing the U.S. dollar. They shouldn't be imposing sanctions via the U.S. dollar. Well, let me just ask you this. Is the dollar collapsing right now before our eyes? Oh, of course not. I mean, look, it, it's a little, again, the, the most important FX exchange rate in the world is, is a dollar euro exchange rate. And, and, the, and, the, and the euro against the dollar, I think the fair value of the dollar euro exchange rate is between about 120 and 140. And, and, and what do we have now? We got the euro. 108 one period 1.087 I, I just looked at it right now on my iPhone so so it, it, it it's very strong it's 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 over it it's stronger than what I think the fair value is the fair value range would put it at about 120 the, it, it's at it's at 108 109 so it's the dollar is very very strong, uh, and and it has it has backed off a little bit, a little tiny bit, but but it's at an extreme strength point right right now. I mean today, maybe it won't be tomorrow, but today it's very strong, and it has been very strong for several years against the euro. And the euro is is the second most important currency in the world. So, all right, let's close off on some history. So, you've got you've got the Hanky Cruz World Hyperinflation Table. You've tracked sixty five of them, sixty five cases of hyperinflation throughout history. Uh, Venezuela is a notable example that I know you want to talk about. What can we learn from Venezuela? Okay, number one, sixty five hyperinflations in world history. That's that's an interesting number because world history is that, that's a long time, and and one reason we didn't have any hyper many hyperinflations historically, especially before World War One, is that all the currencies were redeemable into some commodity. We talked about that before. They 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 weren't fiat currencies. The the only time you've ever had Hyperinflations is when all those all those hyperinflating countries had fiat currencies. That they all had they all had bubble currencies. <laughs> they weren't backed by anything. So sixty five you had. Now that's not a very big number, by the way, when you when you think about it. But we've had two hyperinflations in the last ten years in Venezuela. Now what is a hyperinflation? That's where the inflation rate exceeds 50% per month and, and lasts for 30 consecutive days or more. And you've had two of those in Venezuela in the last 10 years. That's when President Maduro just celebrated his 10th anniversary of being in power in Venezuela. So he's he's been the engineer of two hyperinflations and... A, a, a very high inflation right now, the high, the highest inflation in the world. I measured it today, 489% per year is the inflation rate in Venezuela. Since January 1st, 2022, the Bolivar has depreciated by 80, 81%. I mean, it's lost essentially all of its value since January of 2022. So what do you do? To, to, to stop this, unlike Argentina, where I proposed to dollarize, I proposed that Venezuela put in a currency board. And, and it happens, one of the presidential candidates is Roberto Enriquez, and I, I happen to be his chief advisor. So if he wins the election, Venezuela will have a currency board. So we're, we're talking about breaking news here. Now, what would that be? The Bolivar would be issued. It would trade at a fixed exchange rate with the anchor currency, which would be the U.S. dollar. 
and it would be backed 100% but US dollar reserves. Now that would mean that the Bolivar would become a clone of the US dollar. It would be the same as the US dollar. If you didn't like it, the Bolivar, you'd take it in and exchange it at the fixed exchange rate and it would be redeemable, like not, not redeemable for gold, but redeemable for US dollar. And it would be credible because you would know they had 100% reserves for the Bolivars that they were issuing at the currency board. We would smash inflation overnight and stabilize the currency and the economy would start functioning and booming in Venezuela. So that's that's the Venezuela story. So so the way the way you you correct for these endemic currency problems and currency collapses, you either dollarize and get rid of the local currency. So that that's one way, or the other way is that you issue a local currency and you make it a clone of of the anchor, let's say the U.S. dollar, and and and. And that's equivalent of dollarizing. I mean, it okay, you've got a local currency, the Bolivar, but it's the same thing as the U.S. dollar because it trades at a fixed exchange rate and is 100% back with U.S. dollar reserves. So either dollarization or the currency board. I've done dollarizations in Montenegro where I was an advisor as well as Ecuador where I was an advisor. And I've done currency boards in Estonia, Lithuania, Bulgaria, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. They all work like a charm. I know what I'm talking about because I've been there. I've been to that rodeo. Speaking of gold, you have an excellent indicator on the direction of the gold price, the Hanke Kaufner's Gold Sentiment Index. Tell us about that. Well, the, the, speaking of gold, the, I think the, the interesting and now the most interesting way to, to trade it is to use the Hanky Kaufness Gold Sentiment score. And, and that sentiment score, the sentiment in the market is detected by us because we, every hour, look at all the articles that have been printed about gold and determine whether those are bullish or bearish. And from that, text mining that we do, we get a sentiment score. And when the sentiment score, this fluctuates hour by hour. And when it gets very bullish, we know that it will flip back and revert back to a more neutral or maybe even bearish position. So if it's very bullish, extreme bullish, what do you do? You, you liquidate your long position in gold and go short. Or if it's very bearish, you do exactly the opposite. You liquidate your short position and, and go long. Now, gold has been trending up, but the gold sentiment thing allows you to trade the trend. It, it the price is fluctuating around the trend. It could even be flat. Let's let's go to a hypothetical. Even if gold never, didn't change, it stay, it's, its price stayed the same over the long run, the start, start of the year and end of the year price was exactly the same. You'd make a lot of money trading the sentiment index because there'd be fluctuations, bullish, bearish around that, around that flat trend, or it's been increasing. And by the way, we're, we're getting on our, on our apps that are associated linked to the sentiment index, we're, we're turning in returns about between about 30 and 50 percent. So so you can make good money trading this volatile fluctuations around the trend of gold. And of course, gold, I happen to, to like, and that's why we started measuring this sentiment index. It's the only index like this in the world. You, you can put up your readers can get to that by by going to www.goldsentiment.com, I think. I'll put a link in, in, in the, the index. On I the knew screen. I forgot, forgot something. Anyway, if they go to the website, they can see what the whole thing is about. If you, if you, uh, I, I can't remember all these acronyms and 
Googling numbers and everything. Uh, well, actually, it's the, it's the, it's the goldcentimentreport.com. That's the URL. So we'll put that in the link down below and uh, people can. David I, David, I know when to buy and sell something, but I don't know how to. Read. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> We'll put the right link down for the audience. The gold sentiment report.com. Check it out. Great indicator. Put in the link down below. Uh, Professor Hanky, I appreciate your time. That was very educational. Thank you for uh, calming our nerves for a lot of people who think the dollar is collapsing right now. You know, maybe, maybe in the distant future, we'll have a conversation about this and we'll, you know, you'll change your tune, but for now it's not collapsing. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Good to be good to be with you, David. Yeah, good to have you on the show as always, Professor Hankey. And if you want to know Professor Hankey's uh, thoughts on inflation, we did an episode about that uh, a couple weeks ago. I'll put a link to that in the description below, and we'll we'll do a follow up uh, next month or something. I, inflation's been coming down like you predicted, so I'll speak to you again soon, Professor. And uh, thank you for watching. I'm David Lynn. Stay tuned for more. Don't forget to subscribe. <laughs>